Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to answer some questions. 20 Questions, Volume 2. Welcome back and thanks for being here. I've got some projects in the works that I'm anxious to share with you, but they're not quite ready. So I'm going to take this opportunity to answer some frequently asked questions. I've already done this once before. I have a 20 questions. I will call it volume one. I'll link it up here. And this is volume two. And this video, like that video, what I've done with them both, because they get a little lengthy, is I have indexed all the questions. So if you don't want to watch the whole video, you can just scroll through the list in the description below. And if there's a question there that you would like to see the answer to, click on it and it'll take you straight to that question. That way you don't have to watch this whole video. You can just click on what interests you. I'm going to go straight down the list and I have grouped questions that are similar together. So hopefully I can just rattle them off. We'll see how this goes. So the first question, how would you describe the performance improvement in going from stage one to stage two with the downpipe? I'm stage one and it was the best bang for the buck I've ever done. I agree with that. Stage one, just putting a tune on your car really wakes it up and it makes the biggest difference. Going to stage two, not quite as much. They say, I think that if you add seven horsepower, I can't remember if it's seven horsepower or 7%, but seven horsepower at the minimum is what it takes to feel the difference. And stage two, I believe, gives you 16 extra horses and I think 25 uh, pound feet. I, I'll, I'll put something up here to, to let you know what it is because I can't remember off the top of my head. And I did feel that. It wasn't like a, a tremendous kick in the shorts or anything like that, but I could tell. And I did not do the APR intake. I've never really been a fan of intakes. My goal was to get that additional low end oomph and, um, and it did it. It gave me the extra torque down low. Up top, sure, I could feel it, especially after I did the updated tune. Uh, I don't know what to call it, but it was like the final version, right? I, I did that one later. I'll, I'll link that one up here too. And um, is it worth it? Uh, it's a lot of money to go, you know, if you get the intercooler and the downpipe, and especially if you add that expensive intake. But, you know, the, my garage did not charge me to flash the stage two, uh, but I, I did have them put on the, the downpipe and the intercooler. And so it was bang for buck. No, it's not very high. In fact, if you're if you're here and you're driving a 1.8 turbo, I would definitely say the stage two is not worth it. When you look at the dynographs, the money's just not there. The GTI and the Golf R, probably worth it if you're looking to sink money into the car anyway, but I think you could be just as happy without it. What clutch are you running with the Stage 2? I'm running the HS Tuning RSR clutch. And um, a related question is, what are your thoughts on the clutch kit? Does it hold well? How many miles on it? Um, Wow, I don't remember how many miles were on it. I want to say probably 70,000 miles, 65 or 70,000 miles, and it's holding up really well. The RSR clutch is basically a, uh, it's, it was originally intended as an improvement for the Audi TT RS. And some people piecemeal these parts together. They just shop online and they get them and the, HS Tuning supplies it as a kit and you pay more for it, but you don't have to do the research and dig up the parts and then piece it all together and drill your stuff because you got to drill some holes in the, uh, oh, I'm going to mess that up. I don't want to say what it is, but there's a piece that you have to drill some alignment holes into and it's it's not a big deal, but I, I didn't want to mess with it because I'm not um, very comfortable working with clutches and stuff like that. So I figured if I was going to pay somebody to do the job anyway, then I wanted something that they were not going to have to tinker with. I wanted them to just unbox it and put it in. And the uh, RSR clutch is just the right thing for that. It's supposed to hold, uh, well, let me back up. It was at the time advertised to hold 480 pound feet, which is very impressive. I'll never approach that in this car, but I have to admit that I was a little disappointed to later go back to the website and see that they rate it to hold 480 pound feet in the Mark 6, and in the Mark 7, it's less. I want to say it's like um, 380. Um, 
it's a lot less. So they no longer recommend this clutch for the IS38 upgrade. And that's that's a little disappointing. I wish I knew that at the time because I'm not in a hurry to do an IS38 upgrade, but if I blow up my turbo, then it's gonna be a natural path of progression for this car. And uh, when I bought the RSR clutch kit, I bought it under the advertisement that it holds 480 pound-feet. And now, now that I know that it doesn't, I mean, I, I would drop an IS38 in there and run with it and see what happens, but I would also budget for a different clutch just in case. So that's that's the RSR clutch. As packaged and as equipped in my car, it's been fantastic. You probably know that I tow, and my heavy my heavy loads have been around 1,500 pounds, and sometimes I sometimes I dog it, sometimes I don't. I have never even felt an itch, a hint of it slipping. So it's been wonderful in this car. Stage two, IS38, not quite sure. Which downpipe do you have? Um, I, kind of, I kind of hinted it in the first question. I've got APR's downpipe, and it is a catted downpipe. It's, of course, it has a different cell makeup than factory. And so uh, I know one of the exhaust shops I used to go to uh, all the time for work, he will not touch the car with an aftermarket catalytic converter, so he wouldn't touch the car when I wanted to do a resonator replacement and and I respect that decision these exhaust shops can they can get some pretty heavy fines for messing around with uh, some exhaust modifications and so he shot away from it even though I'd have been a pretty decent customer of his so I went someplace else and uh, they did the work but I'm not really satisfied with it so I'm about to uh, I'm about to get some work done on the car and it might surprise you If you don't like loud exhaust, why are you doing upgrades to your car? Um, what do upgrades and loud exhaust have to do with each other? I mean, making a loud car doesn't necessarily make it perform better. I've I've seen plenty of cars that when they step on the they step on the gas and all they do is make a bunch of noise and they don't go anywhere. I'd rather have a car that's completely silent and goes like stink. Now this car is not completely silent, but I knew I could have a car that has a lot of get up and go and does not make a lot of noise at the same time. I mean, it does make noise because it's it's still a GTI. It's still going to have some uh, some exhaust noise and you're still going to know when I step on it, but it's not obnoxiously loud. So that that's my tuning philosophy is to make it as quiet as I can. And like I said, I'm about to have some exhaust work done and I don't expect it to be any louder than this. And if it's quieter, then that'll be even off. That'll, that'll be even better. Have you had to change your transmission mount yet? Um, no, my my exhaust hanger failed. It's there's it's a few videos back. I think I can link it up here, and that I believe was caused by a um, an alignment issue with the APR downpipe. I, I kind of blame the uh, the engineering behind that on that blown mount, but at the same time I can't help but wonder if my if my engine and transmission were held even more stable. If that'll help protect that and so I want to upgrade my engine mounts and transmission mount probably going to go with BFI the um, stage 2 I think it's called it's whatever their softer one is I don't need full firm or anything like that but I'm gonna get that and see if it works and well either it works or it don't right it's not coming out of the car and uh, it's gonna put it in and run with it I'm kind of stubborn if I do an upgrade I'm gonna run it until it breaks and so Yes, so I have not replaced my my engine and transmission mount. I don't think that I need to, but I'm going to because I want to experiment a little bit. What brand and viscosity engine oil are you using? How much oil does the engine take? Um, oh gosh, I forgot the name of it. I didn't look it up. It's um, it's the Liquid Molly. And I can't pronounce the, the German name at the bottom of it. I'll 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 put a description up here. Don't I don't fret too much over my oil. I, I I get what I know is going to work, and I get what I know is rated to work in the engine. And then believe it or not, I I follow the factory recommendations, and that leads me to the next question. Curious to know what your oil change interval is, especially stock versus stage one, stage two. And I still do 10,000 mile oil drains. This particular oil drain, I am at 100 and almost 102,000 miles. And when I get to 103,000 miles, then this oil batch will have 10,000 miles on it. 
I'm going to drain it and send a sample off for analysis and I'll be sure to let you know how that turns out. So I'll, I'll know right away and I'll share with you if the car under my driving habits, even though it's stage two, how well the oil's performing if, and if it's holding up. I have never been let down by a 10,000 mile oil drain in, in any of my cars, especially since switching over. I mean, I've been driving turbo cars since 1998. And so, um, yes, definitely with the turbocharged cars, full synthetic, always, always, always. And I've never been let down by running full synthetic for 10,000 miles. Is that a remote oil drain on your car? Um, uh, it is a valve on the oil pan that allows me to just crack it open. I can crack it open, take a sample and close it if I want. But I, I always just do a drain. I don't. 10,000 miles is plenty on oil change. Even if they said, oh, no, the oil's in fantastic shape. You can run it another 5,000 miles. I wouldn't. I would just drain it at 10,000. But the idea is to that I could crack it open, get, a, you know, get a, a container under there, crack it open, take a sample and close it maybe at 5,000. Send it off for analysis, and if they say your oil's good for continued service, then I keep on running with it. But I have it I have it under there at the time, mostly so I can just crack it open, let it drain it, and close it. And then I didn't have to worry about crush washers or anything wearing out on my oil pan. But lately I've been doing my oil drains with uh, through the dipstick tube. I've got a suction device that I suck it out with. So I only ever, I don't even have that... Uh, it's called a Fomoto valve. I don't even have the Fomoto valve on the car right now. I, I haven't disposed of it, but it's not on the car because I'm extracting through the dipstick tube. But I will crack my oil drain to take this sample. Do you have a catch can? This is several questions all at once. Do you have a catch can? Regarding carbon buildup, do you have a catch can? Have you considered installing a catch can? And then what is your experience with intake valve carbon cleanup? Uh, I'll get to that one last. The catch can, no. Um, I saw a thread once that uh, in discussion forum that said it was titled something to the effect of uh, five things you're wasting your money on. And before I even read that, I had read that the uh, PVC systems in these cars is very effective. Uh, and most people with catch cans, at least in, in this configuration, they, they just don't really drain much out of it. I mean... Sure, there might be a little oil in it, but is it really that gunky? And then, uh, I don't know, you're, you're going to get blow by anyway. They're, I think their concern is intake fouling and stuff like that. And the seals on the turbo, especially if you if you uh, idle the car a lot, they're going to let little little drips by and everything. And so it's, I'm not convinced that a catch can really saves the intake valves that much. And... I could be completely off my rocker and wrong about it because the answer to the what is the experience on the intake carbon cleanup um, or buildup, I, I don't know. I My mechanic, um, he's very reasonable. He won't even bother removing the intake manifold to, and to check or ramming a camera down to take a look. His opinion is he doesn't want to waste his shop labor or my money unless the car has a cold start misfire. He says that's how it starts. It starts with a cold fire, excuse me, a cold start misfire. And of course, once the car is warmed up and I restart, I go someplace, I restart, it'll start right up. And then from a cold start misfire, it will evolve into warm starts and hot start misfires. And so once I get that first cold start misfire, then it's time to go to the shop and have him do his thing. And he's not a believer in doing it before that. And so like I said, I'm at almost 102,000 miles, and I've never had even a hiccup out of this engine. And and I don't know, maybe towing the trailer from time to time, especially when it's heavy, is good for burning off some of those deposits. I might be really wrong about that, too. But no, nothing. The car still gets 35, over 35 miles at a gallon if I'm nice with it. I got 39. What was I testing for? I was just recently did a test for some reason. Oh, it was when I did the Stage 2 um updated tune i took it for a uh, circuit drive and i got 30 either 38 or 39 miles to the gallon so apparently the intake is still fine so i yeah no catch can and seemingly no problem with my intake valves 
what kind of battery cover that you have. I can't tell you a brand name. It is something that I got through um, AliExpress and those little shops, uh, I, I'm pretty sure they're all in China. I don't want to sound like I'm picking on a Chinese merchandise, but um, these are little fly-by-night shops that open and close on a whim. So I can't even put a link in the description below to say here's where I got it because I have two of them and each time I bought them from someplace else. So what I'll do is I'll put a link in the description below that when you click on it, it will automatically give you the results of a search request for the term Volkswagen battery cover. And so you might see some cloth ones in there, but you'll see the hard plastic ones. And they range anywhere from $7 to $15. The shipping is super cheap. And for even if it's $15 or $20, it's a piece of plastic. It's not going to be damaged. They package it pretty well. And if you don't like it, throw it in the trash. I think they fit well. And uh, somebody already commented that it looks good. So there, there's your answer about that. With the Showcase 15, is there any interference to opening the hatch? Um, no. In fact, the, um, the crossbars on the Golf and GTI, they can only go back so far. And the Showcase can only slide back so far. I wish it could slide back farther because if it could, I would take it back as far as I can towards just barely an inch from the hatch when it's open. If I were to put these crossbars where the dealer says to put them or where the crossbar manufacturers say to put them. I've got a Rhino rack and um, a Yakima rack. I put them farther back than they're supposed to because I don't like I don't like the the, uh, the cargo box sticking out over the front of the car. Some of that is unavoidable, but um, no, you're not going to have any problems with it in interfering with the back. Now on a wagon uh, or perhaps the Atlas and the Tiguan that, that have cross rails built into them, uh, where you're able to slide those crossbars forward and aft. Sure, if you push them back too far, then it could interfere. But if you're smart about it, um, mount the box forward and then take a measurement and then slide it back until you get it to where you want it. And so in short, no, it's not going to interfere. Now, if I got the, uh, the, the large one, like the 20 cubic foot box, um, yeah, that one probably will impact. And if it doesn't, then it's going to hang way out over the front of the car and I shopped. I cross shopped uh, 21 cubic foot boxes and it's just a monster on this car. And I could have tolerated that. It would have been kind of uh, comically huge, but it was just going to stick out too far, even if I was able to slide it all the way back. And then uh, somebody who knows that my cargo box leaks would just squirting some silicone gel sealant in the rivet holes internally uh, resolve the leaking. And I don't believe that they would because the way the box is built with these fittings from the inside. These are just like plastic rivets. I can't get to the back side. I mean, I can get to them, but I can't pull them off to seal inside of them. And in my opinion, this is something that probably should have been done when the box was built. I should really do a, a product review on the Yakima showcase. Um, I was really disappointed with the leaks, but wrapping the box was the best thing for sealing those leaks because now the water doesn't even touch the rivets it just dribbles right over the wrap and it's done so uh yeah that's that's my take on the leaks what is your regimen for exterior body care car washes waxing etc um i'm kind of terrible about it uh i would i used to wax my car once a year uh maybe do a um a clay bar on it. I did I did do the clay bar on this car when I first bought it and then again a year later and then I went ahead and ponied up for a ceramic coating on the car and that just changed everything. The guy who did the work, he did the full paint correction. He he got out swirl marks and little blemishes that have been in the car for a year or so, maybe maybe 18 months. And the car looked phenomenal. It's really hard to see the shine on a reflex silver car, but it was just fantastic. If you've got the money, even if it costs a thousand bucks, it's just worth it. I mean, this guy didn't charge me a thousand bucks because he's working out of his house. I think most places will charge around a thousand bucks, maybe even more. It's worth it. I, 
I hardly have to do anything to the car anymore. I wash it every couple weeks or so. I wash it in my driveway. I never take it to the car wash anymore because uh, the ceramic coating endures better if you use, uh, you know, washes and stuff that are made for ceramic coating. So uh, that's my regimen. It's not a really good one, but it works. And so I wash the car every other week, I suppose, unless I see that rain is coming and then I don't wash it. Like it's supposed to rain all next week, so I'm not going to wash the car. It's kind of dirty right now. And when I see sunshiny week coming up, I wash the car and then I blow it dry with a leaf blower. Uh, I've got an electric leaf blower, so I just blow it dry. My neighbors think I'm crazy. And that's it. The uh, ceramic coating is supposed to last for three years and I, I'll probably get it done again if I'm keeping the car after, uh, after by then the car will be about six years old. How is your timing chain holding up? Um, I have no idea. I, if I don't hear funny noises out of the car, I don't investigate problems. So I've read before I bought the car that the timing chain design on this engine, what the EA888 Gen 3 is, I'll say a huge improvement, but I'll just say an improvement because I can't remember if it's fast or not, but it's a big improvement over the previous Gen uh, 2 liter. And um, I'm hoping that what happens is I'll start to hear some rattling or something or maybe some weird little clicks or just something different that will give me an indication that something's worn out in there. And then I won't mess around. I'll go straight to having the timing chain and tension and everything replaced. But if I don't hear funny noises, I'm not chasing down problems that don't exist. Are you in the Virginia Beach area? If so, did you run up against a GTX 2867R Turbo Beetle Surf Blue? Um, first, um, I'm not really from the Virginia Beach area. It's about an hour away. And second, if I saw a blue beetle on the road, I would not know that it had a GTX 2867R Turbo installed. And third, I never street race. Um, it's just foolish. I'm sorry for those of you who like to go run in Mexico. That's just idiotic, especially when you're doing it at night and can't see what's on the road in front of you. Be it some dimly lit lights, some doofus driving down the road with his lights off, animals, just whatever. It's not worth it to me. I The, the closest thing I've had to contests of speed would be um, maybe making an aggressive pass and then perhaps the guy in the other lane decides he wants to not let me. If he doesn't have the power to stop me from doing it, I do just let her rip and keep on going and just go around him. If he's given me any challenge whatsoever that's that's worthy, I immediately yield. My goal is to not be have him blocking my way so that I can proceed with what I'm doing. And so if if they stomp on it and, and race away from me, mission accomplished, I'm happy. I, I don't need to be in front of them. I just want to proceed at whatever stupid speed it is that I'm driving. And if he if he enables me to do that by racing away, I'm thrilled. So I'm not going to complain about that. So uh, no, I, I don't street race. Did you buy your car brand new? Yes, I did. I am kind of uh, prissy when it comes to prior ownership. I can't stand the idea of cigarette smoke in the car. Um, if somebody did something with it and then didn't tell me, um, just stuff. I hate tripping over other people's problems. Maybe it's not on the surface because I mean the dealer, of course, the salesperson is going to tell me whatever I want to hear to sell me the car. He's either going to outright lie or he just doesn't know, but he's going to, he's going to shine the truth a little bit. And um, no, I don't need that, that, that stuff. I, I know on this car what I have broken and replaced and um, I would disclose that to a, a buyer and I would give him an avenue to stay in touch with me and, and ask me questions if, uh, so let's say he found something and I was like, ooh, I forgot about that. Yeah, here's blah, 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 blah. So yeah, that's why I buy. I always buy new and yes, I know there's a huge depreciation hit, but I keep my cars long enough to where I, I don't keep them for resale value. Financially, it's foolish to buy cars new, but it's still just what I do. So overall, are you glad that you purchased this car? Yes, I'm very glad. This is probably the best car I've ever owned. And perhaps the older I get, every car is going to be the best car that I've ever owned because cars are continually getting better and better and better. And even though I can afford more car now than I could when I was 20, the Golf and GTR are right at that level of car that I want. I don't need an Audi or 
other expensive cars to be happy. Um, this car has given me no hassles whatsoever. I mean, sure, when you when you look at my three year anniversary video, you might think that I have a piece of junk because I literally went down every little problem that the cars have, but those problems are so small and petty. And the only ones that left me stranded were, were the dead battery. Uh, one dead battery is completely my fault. And then the second time, the battery had just reached its lifespan. I've got a lot of electronics packed in this car, and so I'm asking a lot of my batteries. And uh, now I've got a much better battery, and I don't expect it to, uh, to fail on me anytime soon. So by the time this car starts giving me problems that I think are significant, it's going to be easy enough to say, well, yeah, it's... It's got 150,000 miles on it, or yeah, it's this old, or whatever. It's, I've had what I consider to be 102,000 trouble-free miles. Dead batteries don't count. Sorry, I didn't need a tow truck or anything like that. Are you going to buy the Golf 8 then? Um, I don't know. It's At the time that this question was posed, my answer was no. But maybe. Um, prior to COVID, I was driving my car, what, uh, 70 miles a day, which is, uh, you know, you translate that 70 miles a day, that's 350 miles a week, and then sometimes trips, and so I, I think I was driving around 35 or 40,000 miles a year, and lately, I have not been driving that much. At the time... My projection was that when this car is five years old, it would have 175 to 200,000 miles on it. And by then, maybe I want to get rid of it and get something new. I, I don't know. I'd like to keep the car for 10 years unless it gives me a lot of troubles. At least seven. And in seven years, the Golf 8 will be kind of deep into its life cycle. All the refinements and improvements that are going to be done to it will have been done. And maybe I'll get a, um, a Mark 8 then and say say when this car seven years old so that would be uh, a 2004 model maybe then and that almost ties into this next question my family has always said the gti does not do one thing great but it does a lot of things really well have you considered a golf r and um yes i have considered a golf r for the money, I just don't know that it's worth it for me personally, the way I drive. I mean, sure, I could get a Golf R stage two, have traction in spades, have power, have a lot of fun. But realistically, the majority of the time, I just drive like an old man. Um, every now and then step on it. And the GTI makes me happy in those scenarios. Now, styling wise, the images that I've seen so far I like the look of the Golf R better than the GTI. Um, the Golf R, of course, has more subtle styling than the GTI, and that seems to be the case with the Mark 8 Golf R versus the GTI. We'll see what happens when these cars actually come to uh, North American shores. So that's it. Those are my 20 questions. Uh, some of them were two-part questions, and uh, you'll see them all lumped together in my video description below. Check that out. I've got the, uh, the segments linked. And um, if you sat through the whole thing and watched the whole presentation, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, please give me a thumbs up or a like if you like what I'm doing here. And I hope to have some progress done on my project. One of them, you might even see it right behind me. It is completed enough for me, I think, to assemble a video about it. So uh, maybe next week I'll tell you all about it. Until then. Thanks for being here and I'll see you later.